Welcome to another episode of The Rest is Politics Question Time with me, Alastair Campbell. And me, Rory Stewart. Oh my God, Rory, you sound even worse. You sound even worse. I think we're going to have to, I don't know, maybe only speak, only speak if you really feel you have something very, very important to say. And meanwhile, I always have something important to say. So you I'll always have something important talking. to say. I tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to give me one second to get some strepsils. I've ticked you off before for eating crisps. I'm not going to tick you off if I hear a, a strepsil crunch. I know Very good. That. Thank you. I know how. Now, I, I think v- we, we did, by the way, Rory, really get quite a few, not questions, but statements telling us that last week when we were celebrating the fact of Rishi Sunak being the first uh, prime minister in Europe of uh, Asian origin, that we have Leo Varadkar in Ireland and we have Antonia Costa in Portugal. Quite right. And uh, including a correction from your friend David Miliband, who came straight in on that. He did. Leo Varadkar's father, born in Bombay, moved from the UK to work as a doctor, which is true for Rishi Sunak's father too. His mother, though, Leo Varadkar's mother, born in Dungargan, County Waterford. And Costa, I think Costa's father was from Goa, I think. That's my, my th- that, that, if I'm wrong about that, we'll correct that next week. Now, let's get on with, we said yesterday that we'd, we'd talk about Elon Musk. Loads of questions about this. We had another one from, the, from our favorite Swiss school, Lise Tupfer. I think it's Swiss. Hi, us again. What are the consequences of Musk buying Twitter? Teresa Tui, I'm concerned about Musk's response to the attack on Paul Pelosi, but I see it as part of how violence is rising along with misinformation with the use of these technologies, not just in the US, but around the world. Please discuss. And I don't know if you saw this, Rory, but Musk retweeted a kind of right-wing news site conspiracy theory that Paul Pelosi had set up the attack on him in his own house, which I th- I thought was pretty awful. Really big news because Twitter is such an important political platform, probably more than Facebook, actually, because it's what all the journalists follow. It's where all the 24 news cycle comes from. It's where a lot of the fake news has happened. And as we've discussed before, the algorithms of Twitter are set up to intensify confrontation. I sometimes feel that you and I have learned this too, that when I send out a little tweet saying, you know, fascinating piece about a a maiden oak aged 400 years found in a field and, you know, wherever, I get 20 likes. And if I say Boris Johnson needs to go to the International Criminal Court in The Hague, I get like 10,000 likes. So Twitter is an algorithm that intensifies polarization and rewards people for making angry, extreme comments. So the way in which those algorithms are governed really will define the future of our democracy. And so Elon Musk has taken on a huge responsibility. And of course, the early signs are pretty eccentric. He seems to have appointed himself as sole director, got rid of the board. So we're going to have to watch very, very carefully what's going on. There does seem to me to be a, a very, very strong narcissistic element to him, which, which I think happens to a lot of people who, who think that because they become very, very, very wealthy, it means that they think they could actually do anything very, very successfully. Now, a lot of people in the tech world who think he may have taken off more than he can chew, uh, that actually this idea, how you actually in practice manage the tensions between a real belief in free speech, which he claims to have, And the fact of this incredibly important, as you say, platform, where the previous board uh, got into a lot of trouble a lot of times, but did at least give the impression of taking seriously things like the spread of hate crime and racism and so forth. And I just think to see some of the stuff that you don't have to look very hard to see the LeBron James, for example, the, the basketball player was tweeting the other day about, you know, the upsurge that had been in the use of the N word on Twitter. Um, some of the very some of the banned far right accounts in the UK that have suddenly come back. Um, I just get the I just worry the guy is he's, he strikes me as very Trumpian in the way he kind of makes things up as he goes along. I've never also worried. Do you know how he became the the richest man in the world? And is he really? It's a combination of Tesla and SpaceX. I mean, he the, the reason that he's the wealthiest man in the world is that he's set up these very very successful innovative companies, but in particular. He bet an enormous amount of his wealth on them. He's somebody who's a great innovator, but also an enormous risk taker. He's backed his ideas by going all in, and they've paid off enormously. Um, One thing to say is that Twitter was in trouble before Elon Musk took it over, in particular with bots. 
and there's been some extraordinary articles. There's a guy called Jeff Goldberg who's written quite a good article on Medium on big tech's accountability problem, which is arguing that Twitter was well aware of a lot of the manipulation taking place across their platform, yet refusing to address it. And often when he raised with Twitter, the number of bots that were operating, his, his account would be frozen by Twitter and people wouldn't follow up on it. Now, admittedly, that article was written some time ago. So I think things may be improving a little bit, but even before Elon Musk took over, this question of bots, I had a friend look at the number of bots that seem to be following both you and me. And the number is actually quite terrifying. And the number of bots that follow people like Boris Johnson are terrifying. And it's extraordinary, these factories of creating these accounts which follow each other, generate very similar sounding messages. One of my friends looking at Alistair's account reckon that nearly 20, 30% of your followers could be aggressive bots being set up to attack you. Mm. Well, I very rarely look at the responses, so I wonder if they shouldn't have a day off. I don't know. That book I mentioned, by the way, um, Christopher Wiley's book, and I know Carol Cadwallader, I've heard her say this as well, that uh, the concern that actually whether it's even possible to have what we would define as fair elections, because so much of this stuff is happening, we don't really have a way of assessing the, the impact. But I, I, what I don't like about Musk is he just, he just strikes me as being very cavalier about what a serious issue is. And I think to have retweeted that thing about Paul Pelosi, I mean, you know, whatever anybody thinks about Nancy Pelosi, the, the idea of her 81-year-old husband being attacked in his bedroom by a guy with a hammer who's trying to kidnap his wife and the right wing so hates Nancy Pelosi that they spread this story that the guy, that Pelosi was staged it and he was drunk and so forth. And Elon Musk retweets that story with the thing, maybe there's more to this than meets the eye. Now, he probably thinks he's just being mischievous, but I think he's being a complete, I know I won't say the word. Well, well one, of, one of the great things that we discussed a couple of weeks ago is that the courts are beginning to fight back. You remember Alex Jones being ordered to pay $965 million for his lies yeah. about Sandy Hook. Yeah. Um, I also think, there's going to have to be government intervention and regulation on the algorithms around these platforms, ultimately. Didn't, didn't Musk say that he was going to be more open about the algorithms and how they work? He, he said that. Yeah. He's, he said a lot of things which are quite encouraging. We've got to have to watch where that goes. Mm. There's a lot of great questions coming in this week, but, but here's, here's one for you. Robin Hall, off the back of the present Hollande interview, struck by the fact that he said that nation states' power is waning to corporations who operate with no borders. How do nations address this power shift? Why are few democracies so reluctant to take on this corporation? So many elements there, elements around climate, but also this extraordinary question around tech companies not paying mm. tax. The fact that Amazon is this huge trader in the UK, yet they still seem to pay a tiny fraction of the tax that high street retailers mm. would pay. I, I thought it was, I, I was really chuffed actually. I mean, <laughs> I sent, I sent Francois Hollande a message saying that his, his interview and his English and what somebody described as his cute accent were going down very, very well. And, um, we actually got a lot of listeners for President Hollande. And, 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 and I thought he, I thought he made some really interesting big points. And that was one of them. That question about whether the nation state is now more or less powerful than the big corporations. Now he said that he still felt the nation state did have that power, but I think if, I think if you're in politics, you feel you have to say that. But he said that the public, for a lot of the public, they respect the power of the nation state a lot less than they respect the power of some of these uh, big corporations. And of course, look, the reason, one of the reasons why they have that power is because they do operate multinationally at a time when nations, the nation states themselves, are becoming more inward looking and not operating in such a multilateral way, you can't you can't leave you can't operate the legal framework that we talk about for some of these companies unless you do so on an international basis. So just very quickly for people who are interested in this, Amazon is a key example of one of these companies that there's very little transparency around the tax it pays. There was a good Guardian article, Sarah Butler, Mark Sweeney looking at this. But basically, they won't declare what their profits are. They keep insisting that while their revenue is going up, they're making losses. And as a result, they pay very little tax for a company their size. Let's just have one quick one, another one on Musk here. Peter H., as highlighted by Musk taking control of Twitter, can the big social networks be trusted 
not to fuel hate, divisiveness, extremism, and being used as a tool for political manipulation, can and will governments prevent this? Well, of course, the Chinese would argue that they do prevent it, and they prevent it with complete control, which would not be acceptable to people in Britain, people in Europe, people in the United States. You could imagine a regulator, couldn't you? You could imagine a good equivalent of a sort of Ofcom or an Ofgen for all their flaws, but strong independent regulator trying to look at those algorithms. The thing about Twitter and Facebook and these other, they, they operate across borders. They don't, they, then it's not like a, a newspaper that is published in a country. They, you know, if, if I, if you or I do a tweet now, it goes to anybody who follows us, follows us anywhere in the world. So the only hope would be to get the US government and the European Union to do it together. Yeah. That would be the only scale at which you'd have any hope of being able to regulate. That was the answer. Somebody called Grant Beerling, he answered. We now get people answering questions for us on Twitter, Rory, because the question that you put came over Robin Hall, and Grant Beerling answered on Twitter. The answer is there are only two who can challenge with any clout, the US, which is the reserve currency holder, and the EU, which is the largest trading bloc on the planet, UK, not a chance. So I think we are, we can't do this without going to, in with uh, with other countries. Nathan Wilkins, here's one for you, Rory. Um, first of all, just want to say the pod is brilliant. Thank you. As an A-level politics student, that's Nathan. Question for Rory, how difficult is it to become an MP? How many different processes do you have to go through? Is there an induction day for new MPs after an election? Well, the answer is you have to jump through an enormous number of hoops. But it doesn't matter whether you're talking about the Conservatives, the Labour or the Lib Dems. The fundamental truth is it's all controlled by the parties and a lot of the power rests with the local parties who ultimately choose who their candidate will be. I've got a friend running to be a, a Labour MP in a London seat. He's an incredibly strong candidate and I think the Labour Party would be very lucky to have him. Global experience, he's incredibly intelligent, diverse background. But in his case, his local association is controlled by a group of quite left-wing Corbynistas and it's very difficult to break through. Mm. Same problem for my friend Tristram Hunt mm -hmm. when he was trying to hold on in Stoke. Yeah, It's the same in some of the conservative seats too, which is that some of those seats up in the Red Wall will be controlled by very, very strong Brexit supporting members who won't want to have more remain-minded conservative MPs. So it's a brutal system. We, you know, we've talked about the fact that MPs are disproportionately still privately educated, university educated. I mean, that's one thing that many more university educated MPs than the population as a whole. But there's another problem going on, which is the grip of these parties and the way that if you haven't been a local councillor, you haven't delivered leaflets from when you're in your teens, if you haven't been in your university club, it's surprisingly difficult to break through. And that's before you get into all the micro politics of the way in which local parties can be taken over by factions in the mm. way that some of Corbyn's supporters took over Labour factions, making it difficult for good candidates to come through. I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that it's probably best if you don't name the Labour friend. I'm, not, I'm, I'm, think, I'm getting the feeling from his local party that support from centrist dad, Rory Stewart, is not going to help him. <laughs> would that be right? That would be correct. Andrew Newsom. Has any other prime minister in British history prior to Rishi Sunak had three previous prime ministers of his own party sat on the back benches. Does the fact that he does put any extra pressure on Rishi Sunak? I'm guessing it's definitely, it must be the first time because we've never had such a churn. First time for a very, very long time. It, one of the things that's changed, of course, is we've got used since Tony Blair and David Cameron and Gordon Brown to, and John Major, in fact, to MPs leaving parliament when they cease to be prime minister. But of course, in the old days, and Ted Heath was an example of this. Stayed on. He sat there growling at Miss, Mrs. Thatcher. Exactly. So in the 19th century, you had a lot of ex-prime ministers sitting around on the back benches, and they remained in parliament almost until they died. So, But you have to go back a long way to have that number of pr previous prime ministers. And of course, they do put pressure. There, there's been some lovely articles about it, because they tend inevitably to think their successors do nothing but problem. People who haven't heard our interview with William Hague, he's very funny and reflective about the problems of having former prime ministers sitting behind you, thinking that everything you're doing is wrong. All right, let's take a quick break there, Rory, and we'll be back in a minute. Barbara Kemp, let's completely change the subject here. I recently found out that one of my children is trans. 
I was never particularly interested in the gender wars until now, and I fear for my child in this hate-fueled environment. How would you take this in your family, and how can the debate be made more humane in your view? It's a very tough one. We, we've discussed this a little bit before, haven't we? And, and the truth is that when I discussed it before, people said I got a lot of very negative comments. My, my general instinct on this is very pro-trans, and I have a lot of friends who've got children, particularly teenagers, who are identifying with many, many different types of gender identity. But the pushback that I got is that I'm also underestimating the fact that other groups feel that some of the campaigners in favor of trans rights can themselves be unbelievably aggressive and hateful. Mm. And if we were to get, obviously, J.K. Rowling on this on this podcast, she would say that she feels that she's been the victim of any very unfair abuse. It's an unbelievably polarized issue, even more than our conversation about the National Trust last week. This is something where both sides feel very, very righteous and very, very angry. But I think that's why when you get that from a parent who, as she said, I was never particularly interested in the gender wars. And I suspect that's the majority of parents. I think most people probably wouldn't, if they're asked to list their three biggest issues, it's unlikely that this would be there. But then if one of your children is trans, then obviously it's going to become a big issue. And then, you know, if she talks about the hate-fueled environment. And that's why I do think our political leaders have the, – the, you, you talked about the word polarization there. Any issue at the moment being seized upon. I saw some of the comments that were being made by some of your former colleagues, Tory MPs, about Eddie Izzard recently. And I thought – Okay, they want to have a pop at Eddie Izzard, you know, because that has that allows them to have a pop at Labour. But actually, it's also having a pop at Barbara Kemp's child, who is going through this process. And I just think that given that trans people are amongst the most discriminated and abused anyway. Just for people who haven't been concentrating, the reason they've been talking about Eddie Izzard is that Rosie Duffield, who is the Labour MP for Canterbury, won't call Eddie Izzard a woman. Mm. And there have been a number of Labour groups have called for her to have the whip removed, said that she's bigoted and transphobic. But of course, she's also attracted quite a lot of sympathy. And the reason why the Conservatives, of course, have been exploiting this is that there are many, many people in the country who, of course, will sympathise with Rosie Duffield. And it's probably not a position that Labour wants to get itself trapped in, mm. fighting that particular war. No, and, and, and it is, as Barbara says, it, it, it is the... You know the, the the culture. I think the culture wars, and and I was very disturbed to read the other day that Rishi Sunak apparently has some unit, same as Johnson did. That's what, I don't know if this is true, but I read it in one of the broadsheets that he's got this unit that's there to sort of try and stoke a few more culture wars and get Labour on the wrong side of some of these cultural arguments. What about this one then, Rory Fox? Are women's reproductive rights safe in the UK? Sunak has appointed Maria Caulfield as Minister for Women. She voted against legalising abortion. In Northern Ireland, she supports cutting the abortion time limit, and she belonged to a parliamentary pro-life group. If that is true, that does seem quite an extraordinary appointment. Do you think he didn't know? I, I think he probably is reaching out. I'm afraid this is a bit like Suella Braverman. Maria Caulfield is a key figure on the on the right, the Christian right of the party, and he may be trying to create this broad coalition and hold all these people together. I mean, remember, at the heart of this is Rishi Sunak is in a real problem. I mean, nobody really wants to be prime minister at the moment. They blew up Liz Truss. Go on, Rory, you do. You'd love well, it. Well, you know, if, he, if, he, if he'd like to step aside and allow me to be prime minister, <laughs> I would, re you know, very reluctantly lay down my plough and get my voice back. I'd come in with a few strepsils and sort it all out. But, but anyway, the, so the point is that the heart of the problem is obviously Liz Truss mismanaged the different factions in the party, as did Boris Johnson, and they were both taken down in quick succession. So he's in a very yucky situation. I don't think he's somebody who supports regressive views on women's reproductive rights. I don't think he's going to allow legislation to go through changing the UK's abortion position. But I do think that he feels forced to bring in people from the right of the party to try to hold the party together after what's just happened. Mm. Um, as we move towards the end, here's a more serious one for you. Um, maybe give my voice a, a rest because it's something that you've got a lot of thoughts on and I'd like to hear you on. So this is from Colton Richards. Colton Rich has just been reading an article in the New York Times by a, a man I know quite well called David Brooks called The Rise of Global Sadness. And his question is, in what feels like a suffocatingly negative age, how can we push back against worrying trends of people 
seeing sadness and emptiness in what should be happy and fulfilling lives. So on that cheery question, over to you. <laughs> I suppose the first thing is you've got to keep laughing whenever you can. So I guess I'm laughing now because I'm, I'm feeling that you're thinking, Alistair's the one to talk about sadness. Alistair's the one to talk about depression. And I can take give my voice a bit of a rest. So I'm happy to do that, Rory. Look, I think these are incredibly dark times in lots of ways. But I, I, I think that one of the reasons I'm writing this book, you know, what, but what can I do, is because I think it's at times like this that people, we all need to think about our own answer to that question. How do we find purpose? How do we find motivation? And I think that one of the things that keeps me going on the, on the political front is the fact that I can't imagine that things won't at some stage get better. So you always have to have that hope. Even if everything around you is screaming at you, well, there's no logical reason to believe that because we are on our fifth conservative prime minister in six years. Donald Trump is still stalking or stomping around the place in America. Bolsonaro did get 49.1%. The climate is at risk of going up in smoke. Ukraine, we haven't really talked much about Ukraine in recent weeks because it's become so normalized as to what's happening there. I meant to mention this on the on the main podcast, but there's a, there's a great podcast that's done by Spiegel magazine in Germany called Acht Milliarden, which is um, their foreign policy podcast, which if you spoke German, Rory, you would absolutely love. And it's usually quite heavy foreign policy stuff. But this week, it was an interview with their, a, a correspondent, a Spiegel correspondent, a woman who'd been working in Ukraine covering the war. And she found this picture of a family and there were five in the family, and she learned that four of them were dead to the two parents and two sisters, and the son had survived. And she became obsessed about trying to find this son who'd survived. And she did. And she did this interview with him. And honestly, it was absolutely extraordinary. He was a 16 year old Ukrainian boy who had survived because on the night that the bombs fell, he was actually with his 15 year old girlfriend. To, to get the story of, he was in Mariupol, to get the story of the war through his eyes, through what he'd been through, was just extraordinary. And do you know what? At the end of it, I felt, I don't know why, but it just, it, you've, I felt hopeful, not because it wasn't a terrible, terrible, terrible story. He actually found, he went back and he found his own father's body. He found, he saw this bit of hair through the the rubble, and he found his own father. And then he, you know, it was just horrific. But at the same time, there was something about him and the way that he told his story and the way that he articulated himself that I thought, well, my God, he, whatever he does in his life is going to be special. I'm absolutely sure of that. So I, I think you have to find hope even in these awful, awful, awful situations. And so I guess at the moment I find hope in seeing Labour 20-odd points ahead in the polls, but then I feel despair when I see that Rishi Sunak has taken over, has overtaken Keir Starmer and economic management, uh, which says to me the public maybe think that Rishi Sunak had nothing to do with the last few years of Tory government. But what about you? You've got a, you've got a, you can do a very short answer on this, Rory, because, you know, I know you've got the weak voice, but don't you agree? You've just got to try to find hope. Yeah. So, I, I, I mean, I, I'm very hopeful. I mean, I'm obviously the reason I've lost my voice is I've, I've been doing a lot of work with Give Directly recently, and I think we can end global poverty in our lifetime. There are 700 million people in this world living in the most abject conditions, barely able to get a meal a day. And it would cost 0.1% of global GDP to lift those people out of extreme poverty. And we can do it. And despite all the problems with climate, which is making the problems worse, with conflict in Russia, Ukraine, with the recession that's coming in the United States and is already biting in Britain, we can do this. And we just have to recover a sense of generosity and optimism. So I'm at the moment quite fired up, even if my voice doesn't sound like it. Now, here's the, the um, we're recording on Tuesday, Rory, and um, I know you've not been in the UK much. You've probably not seen my TV series, Make Me Prime Minister with uh, Saida and I, but it's the climax tonight. We have three women in the final. But Robert at Euxton Bob, did Labour take their energy policy directly from an idea in Make Me Prime Minister? And it's quite a good question, that, because it was recorded weeks before 
Keir Starmer actually unveiled the policy. And I did not pass it on to the Labour Party. What is the <laughs> energy policy? What was it's the policy? basically a sort of nationalised state green energy policy. In other words, it's a, it's an, a national entity that, has, that takes control of the energy market. It's not dissimilar to what Keir Starmer set out. And which of, your, which of your competitors came up with the idea? It was a guy called Adam Kirby, who's, who I'm afraid did not even make the final. The final was three very good women, Natalie and Kelly and Holly. I can't tell you who won, even though the podcast is going to be out before the final screen, because, you know, for all I know, Roy, you'd, you'd, you'd send a I'd leak it, message. It? I'd, 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 I'd put it straight on Twitter and you'd be wrong. Um, listen, what, what we've just to, to pick up next time, I do think you put your finger on a big issue, which we need to discuss in much more detail, which was this quite good question from Robert Bush, where he says, as Conservative PM, Sunak's pulling ahead of Starmer's on economics in a recent poll. When previously he'd been responsible for the economics brief as Chancellor and the Conservatives, Robert Bush says, have a decade of austerity's wreckage to show for their efforts. How, why, and what must Labour do to cut through? I think that is a really important question. I think Labour is in a strong position. They're 20 points ahead. And uh, John Curtis, the great pollster, Sir John Curtis, says that it's difficult for them to lose when the Conservatives have such a reputation for incompetence. But I do think the Achilles heel of Labour if we go into a prolonged economic recession, it's going to be whether the public think that they have the economics management skills to come out of it. So maybe that's something we could do in a bit more detail in the future. Maybe we should do that as we get closer to Jeremy Hunt's statement, because, you know, reading the, I don't know if you've been able to pick up on the British media today, Rory, but they've obviously been briefed that there's going to be tax rises for all and spending cuts. And I think I'm right that when Osborne was doing Austerity Mark One. The, it was it was roughly eighty percent on the spending side and twenty percent on the tax side, and the the word is that Hunt is going to be much closer to fifty fifty. And of course, we talked a lot yesterday about the the issues of uh, Manston and the asylum system, which appears to be under you know state of pretty near collapse. We're we're talking about you know people who can't get their passport, people who can't get a driving license, let alone when we get into the health service, then we've got the energy energy bills for schools that we've talked about. Any cuts are going to be very very have a, have an immediate impact on some of our public services, which already feel like they're pretty close to the bone. Our friend, the knowledge, yeah, um, they on on the, on the last one of their thing that I saw, they had this very interesting stat which they took from a piece in The Economist. What Vladimir Putin, this is me back on trying to be hopeful, okay, amid really bad, bad stuff going on. What Putin is trying to do in Ukraine, invade a country to make its territory his own, is very rare, says The Economist. In a typical decade between 1850 and 1940, around 1% of the world's population saw their rulers change as a result of conquest. In the 40 years up to the Ukraine war, the proportion was less than 0.001%. God, that's great. Isn't it? There were no large conquests at all between the late 70s and Russia's annexation of Crimea in 2014. That's an amazing statistic. Mm. I think that's a good one to close on. And thank you very much for, for putting up with my croaky well, listen, voice. Rory, thank you for doing it, because I've got to be honest, if my voice was as annoying as yours has been today, I'd have just stayed in bed. Well, there we are. I just couldn't bear the fact that I thought if I left you on your own, I'd have no idea what you were up to. And I do what I did at Blackpool, where I, where I pretended, where you had to go off and yeah, sort you your microphone. To be me, yeah. I pretended it's to be you. On the subject of our Scottishness and our Scottish accents, have you seen the Malcolm Muggeridge interview with Lord Reith, where no. Reith talks about his Scottish accent? It's a lovely black and white clip from the 1960s. No, why? What does he say? Yes, yeah, so, so Lord Reith, who you and everybody listening to this will know, was the great director general of the BBC and is often seen as the sort of quintessential stiff establishment figure, when you actually see him, is a much rawer, funnier, more eccentric man. It's a huge scar down his face, deaf in one ear, massive eyebrows, hair like a kind of cockatoo leaning forward at Muggeridge saying, what do you call that stuff that comes down the chimney? And Muggeridge goes, soot. And he says, where I come from, we call it soot. And it's a lovely moment because you see that, that this guy who you see as a stiff shirt is is much more eccentric and much more Scottish than we remember today. <laughs> Actually, Rory, I think you'd be, I think you'd be a, a good candidate for the Reith Lectures. They're never going to give it to me because I'm seen as a, sort of somebody who took on the BBC, but you'd be good at the Reith Lectures. 
Oh, that's very sweet. Well, you know, if, if you don't manage to persuade Rishi Sunak through the podcast to let me have a go at croaking at Prime Minister's questions, I'll go for that instead. <laughs> I love the way that you think Rishi Sunak sits there listening to our podcast. And uh, as a result, he appointed Gillian Keegan to education, Alex Chalk to defence, Mel Stride to work and pensions. Yeah. Good old Rishi. Yeah, that's Rishi, it. send us a few bob, would you? We, we, could, we could do with just a few million at Burnley for, a, you know, strengthening the squad in the window. Levelling up. <laughs> See you next week. Bye-bye.